Good morning to everyone here in the Northland. Welcome on this blessed Sabbath day, a day that God has set aside for us to get together and commune with him and with each other. I want to welcome you, whether you're in Virginia or Hibbing, Ely, International Falls, North Home, Blackberry, Grand Rapids, or anywhere else here in the Northland or watching uh, on YouTube. We just welcome you this Sabbath morning as we continue on in our second section of our series on the book of Genesis. But before we begin, let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a creator God. And we just ask that your Holy Spirit will be here with us and that you will guide us and direct us. May the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight, O God. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. In the beginning, we have existential issues in the Western world. Last time we looked at the development of rationalism and empiricism, which has made it very difficult for the Western mind to wrap itself around God's word in the way scripture presents the creation of the world. One of the people that I brought up last time as a philosopher was Immanuel Kant. And the story is told about Immanuel Kant. He was sitting in his native Germany on a park bench. And he sat there for hours and hours just pondering the meaning of life. And a policeman who had been patrolling in that area approached him and asked him, um, I'm sorry, sir, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm, I'm just thinking. And he kind of took the policeman back because it was an unusual response, to say the least. And he said, who, who are you? And Immanuel Kant looked at him and he said, that's exactly what I was thinking about. Who am I? You see, when you toss off Genesis 1 and 2, the story of creation, and I asked you last time, what difference would it make in your life if we didn't have Genesis 1 and 2? One thing that the Western mind grapples with is, who am I? Where am I from? What are my beginnings? You don't think this interests people? What about Ancestry.com? People want to know where they're from, their roots. They go back. Am I from Sweden, Germany, uh, Denmark, Spain, India, a, a country in Africa, South America, in Asia? And we dig in our roots. There are whole uh, libraries that are dedicated in museums, sections of museums that are dedicated to genealogy and people finding out where they've come from, what happened to their relatives, why are they like this. And it's just interesting on many levels to understand one's genealogy. Where are we from? And it, it's a human desire. And unfortunately, the Western mind who has thrown off God completely in Genesis 1 and 2 has to come up with other answers to answer this question, who are we, where are we from, why are we here? And the question that people ask, I believe is the wrong one. Because we're looking here, just think of this question. This is a question many skeptics in the Bible ask. If it, everything's so bad, because you can get extremely depressed watching news, figuring out what's going on, uh, economic hardships, crime, family problems, uh, wars, terrorism, you name it. Problems, we, we got it galore. So the Western mind looks at this and skeptics say, if everything is so bad here, how can there be a God who's good and who's love? How could he allow all this? It's a very serious question. And one we must take seriously. We can't dismiss it. Because Spirit of Prophecy told us that this world is so bad that sometimes even we as believers can look at the world and it's so discouraging that we can say it's even difficult to believe that God is a God of love. So we go back. Not, we don't look at from 
our, our perspective, our point of view right now. We look at, we need to go back to the beginning, back where it started. Okay, what was God's plan? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And I ask you this morning, what is your purpose in life? Are you assured of your beginnings? Do you know where you're from? Do you put the correct value upon yourself that you should this morning? You know, it's a very common thing in the West to have low self-esteem. To not feel very valuable. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you see why that might be. Because in our thinking, we've, we've tried to get rid of Genesis 1 and 2. So let's go back. Let's go back to the very beginning. And as we open your, our Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, we only got through one verse last week or last time uh, you watched it since this is on line. I don't know when you watched it. But as we look at Genesis chapter 1 and 2, which we will look at today, I, number one, will assume that you are fairly acquainted with the story. We will not go through every detail. We do not have time for that. But we will just pick highlights, and we will look at overall concepts, and we will apply that to our lives today. In Genesis 1, which we read last week, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a beginning. We're going back to it. And God created the heavens and earth. That is, you look out and you see, in Hebrews 11:3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. That is, God spoke things into existence, and we continue on in verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So what was earth at that time? Uh, appears there's some water. What form was it in? We don't really know. He doesn't go into the scientific aspect of it darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of god was there that is it was chaos it's just like an abyss just kind of this nothingness there was nothing here really i mean maybe there was some water we, we don't even really know uh what form it was in it doesn't really tell us it was empty there was nothing here and the thing we notice about these, this verse, verse 2, again, is the role of the Holy Spirit. We do not have to go very far in the Bible, and we see that the Holy Spirit is playing a vital role in bringing something out of chaos. Do you see why we're praying? And I hope you're praying every morning, 7 and at noon, and at 7 in the evening, for the Holy Spirit. Why do we need the Holy Spirit? To bring order, to bring meaning, to to bring a new creation. See, the Holy Spirit was right there, the very beginning of the story, waiting to help, re to form, actually not even reform, but form our earth. And then we begin on the days. We will not read through each day, but I do want to talk about the evenings and the mornings because, because of this uh, rationalistic environment that we've been living in for the last few hundred years here in the West, there are many, even Christians, that say, well, you know, probably those really weren't days. These were long periods of time. And as we do, uh, as we look at carbon dating, and we see that this earth has been here for a very long time, uh, obviously those, those probably weren't uh, literal days. There is absolutely no way to come to that conclusion if you just read scripture. In fact, the only way you can come to that conclusion is if you don't take scripture very seriously. Because scripture says at the end of every day, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and morning the second day. There was evening and morning the third day. What does that say? For thousands of years, most people that read this just assumed, well, of course, these are literal days. 
There is nothing in the text. I remember hearing Dr. Uh, Richard Davidson at the seminary, who's a Hebrew scholar who, who knows Hebrew extremely well. He said, you know, you can dig in the Hebrew and go through all the words and try to figure out and try to make it seem like these are long periods of time. There is nothing there in the text that would imply that these are long periods of time. In fact, I propose to you today that the only reason Christians have come to this conclusion is to appeal to the rationalistic mind. But let's be very careful. Because scripture does not allow for that. It only allows us, and actually, does, I shouldn't even say allow, it calls us to believe in a creator God who is all-powerful who can do things that we can't fathom, we can't understand completely in very short periods of time. So I propose to you today, again, as we go back and as we look at the development of Darwinism and evolution that paralleled the development of a people on earth that are going to proclaim the three angels' messages and the first angel's message is worship a creator God. There is no reason we have to swallow the Kool-Aid because our God can't be completely understood, and that's a good thing. We don't have to be ashamed of that. We can stand up proud and say, this is what my Bible tells me. This is what God inspired a holy man to tell us enough of what we need to know about the creation story. And then we can go to science and try to understand as much as we can while we're here on this earth. Evenings and mornings, days that God created the heavens and the earth. So we start off in day one. And before we even get to day one, we have to notice a pattern here. That if we set up the days, days one, two, and three here, and days four, five, and six, we notice that there is a correspondence between each one. So we will just look at each day in correspondence with three days after it. So here at the beginning, we have days one and four. What happened on day one? God created light, day and night. We don't really understand how that was because on day four, he gave the sun, moon, and stars to govern the day and the night and the light that would be here on earth. So we see that God set something up in the beginning, and then later in the week he comes back and compliments it. What an interesting dynamic. Let's look at it again, days two and five. He creates the firmament. He, has these, he separates the water from above from the water that's below and creates what usually we call the sky atmosphere. Uh, you know, he, he makes this, this interesting dome. I, I had interesting ideas about this dome. I thought we were actually covered by a dome. I thought that's why it was blue. I thought you had to drill a hole to get out to the moon, uh, you know, with our rockets and stuff to get out. When I was a very little boy, I'd look up in the sky and I'm like, how, how do you get to the moon, you know? Because that was a big deal going to the moon. You have to drill a hole through this dome. And it's really amazing. You go outside and this dome is blue in the day and, and, and dark at night. And it kind of keeps us in our little bubble where we can breathe and where we have, you know, basically the right temperatures. We might prefer them somewhat warmer at times or, or cooler, depending if it gets real hot. But here's this bubble around the earth creating this, this sphere that, that creation can live in. And guess what on day five? Just like day four, he, he fulfilled what day one was the basis for, the, the foundation for, in the same thing on day five. He adds the fish and the birds and living beings. And by the way, day five is the first blessing that God gives because the animals now have this spirit, this breath of life, and he blesses them. Why? Because he's created something for them. So we see that God creates something. Later he comes back and he fulfills it and makes it uh, so that it can survive and thrive in that environment. Day three, he separated the water, this time not from above and below, but 
sideways, <laughs> move the water over, dry land appears, and on the dry land, vegetation, fruit trees, seed bearing of its own kind so that it would reproduce and cover this land and make it beautiful. So what is he going to put on the land on day six? Well, we see that he puts land animals on day six, all the creatures that crawl across the earth. He made this, this beautiful earth for it, for, for them, and he put them to, sur to enjoy the earth. And then we see the crowning act of his creation on day six. He put man to be on that dry ground. Yeah, I suppose he could get on the water if he wanted, but mainly he was going to live on the land and enjoy it. And that's it. That's the week. So he set it up in days one, two, and three, and then I came back on days four, five, and six, and filled it and made it good. This is the starting point for our understanding of who God is. Now when we look around, sometimes we try to look around and figure out who God is. No, 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 before you try to figure out who God is and, and what God's trying to do in your life now, don't, don't look now, go back, go back to the beginning and look at it. And this is what God said. After every day, what did God say? It's good. It's good. What powerful words. What an, what an unbelievable concept for us. It's almost hard to believe that back then, everything, everything, every last thing was good. No death, no mosquitoes. You'll be happy to hear that here in the Northland. Uh, no robbery, no decay. Everything that we know that makes life a challenge didn't exist. Sickness, illness, it was all good. Everything was good. Also, as your lesson brought up a few weeks back, the Sabbath school quarterly, everything was separate. God has his boundaries, and he sets things up so that they're se separate. Did you notice the whole story is about separating light from darkness, day and night, land from water, water from below from water from above. The seeds are separate. That is, they produce only according to their kinds. The plants and the animals reproduce according to their kinds. Humans are separate. That is, male and female. So God has his, his boundaries, his separation. The days are separate from one another. Each, thing, each day he did a different thing. Each day had a purpose. And everything that God did in that creation week has a purpose. That is, God's cosmic order has a purpose. It has a reason. And even if we might not grasp it completely to this day, it has a reason. God always has a reason. And I want us to concentrate, because in the story of creation, we need to see what was God's crowning act of creation. And if you look in Genesis 1, 26, where he creates man, God saw that it was good in verse 25. Let's read this. Then God said, let us make man in our image in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that all that he had made. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. 
Now, chapter two, which we won't read in its entirety because of time, we see how he created man. Everything else he spoke into existence. That is the, the firmament, the atmosphere, the land, the plants, the, the, the trees, the animals even. He spoke, and they became living organisms. But he didn't speak man into existence. The Bible says he formed him out of the dust of the earth. And you see this loving picture of God bending down and bro blowing into his nostrils the breath of life. <clears throat> Later he has compassion upon Adam that he has no helpmate like the other animals did. And he takes, usually what we translate as a rib, but it can be just also translated as side. He takes part of Adam's side somewhere and forms Eve and brings Eve to Adam, the mother of all living beings. And we can not help but be touched that the God of heaven came down and gave a personal touch to man. He didn't just speak him into existence, oh, let's have Adam and Eve, let's have a man and a woman. But, but he comes down and he forms him out of, out of the dust. It's like a, an artist, like, you know, some great sculptor. And, and then breathing into him this life. And then not only breathing into him, but he didn't talk to the rest of the creation. He even blessed the animals, but he didn't talk to them. He talked to Adam and Eve, and he gave them a purpose in life. That is, this creator God is a personal one. He is not even, for those people that, especially at the beginning of our country, that were deists, that God somehow just set the planet into existence and, and let it spin off into its you know, orbit and, and just, well, I hope everything's okay there. That's not the picture we get from Genesis 1 and 2. The picture we get from Genesis 1 and 2 is that God cares. He's intimately related and even creates man in his own image. I just want to concentrate on that for just a minute. I want you to think, did you realize you're created in the image of God? Now some people we don't like to say, well, God doesn't probably have fingers and nose and ears and I don't know, you read the story, you, you certainly wouldn't get anything from that. We're created in the image of God. Then he talks to us as rational beings and gives us this purpose in life and says, here, take care of this. Here, here's, here's a bunch of work for you. He says, created us. let's create man like us, implying some type of triune God that, that's speaking to one another. In the creation story, the Old Testament, and then gave them dominion over the earth. That is something to do. I mean, if we look, just look at the personal touch, he even tells them, this is your food. <laughs> I am supplying everything for you. And here's the food that you, that you want. And I am saying this for one reason and one reason only, is that we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Guess what happens to our minds and our hearts? They should be automatically drawn back to the garden. That is, we should, we should start to um, exemplify what God initially created us for. And this is what God said, I'm going to give you all these vegetables, fruits, nuts, now we have an active chip program here that Mary Moody has done. And guess what scientists are figuring out now? And, and we go through this in the whole program. Guess what science, when they just sit down and look at the, at the raw statistics and data? Yeah, this is the best diet as things are made. Now should this surprise us? It does for a lot of people. Why? We've lost our beginnings. We haven't gone back to the beginning of the story. Of course that would be the best, because that's what God, God didn't, he didn't want to give us anything that wasn't uh, good for us. I mean, can you imagine everything was good, going out and, and killing an animal? Now I understand we're in, we're in hunting country, and hunting is, 
you know, I'm not even going to get into the merits of hunting now in a sinful world uh, when we probably would just have deer all over the place and other animals. But let's just go back to the beginning. In the beginning, everything was good. And why, I, I can only imagine Adam and Eve not wanting to eat meat <laughs> in the sense that I had to kill the animals. Everything was good. It was a different time. God had created us to make us healthy and happy. Part of our happiness was the institute of marriage. Now, I'm saying this because you can't help but recognizing that there were two institutions that were taken from the garden and that we still have today, and one of them is marriage. This was instituted by God. As we mentioned already, God made woman from the side, from the rib of Adam. She was equal to Adam. There was no domination at the beginning of a man over a woman. You know, later on the Bible tells us that God hates divorce because of all the things it creates in children and families, broken relationships. And we see why. Because God gave us marriage to help us. It's a blessing. And as we pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in our district, we should uphold Marriage in God's ideal for marriage. That we are to be helpers for one another. It is to be a blessing, not only to each other, but we give each other strength. We help one another and we become a stronger unit. We see that before God made a government, before he made a city government, before this is the building block of society. A lot of times we focus on federal elections and presidents. But let me tell you, federal, you know, presidents can affect certain things. But really, in the grand scope of life, the further down you go, the more significant it becomes. Local politics actually should be much more significant than federal. But humans like to concentrate on, on federal and, and big picture stuff and not on little picture stuff. But as we go back to the beginning, we see it's just the opposite. God is is giving the building blocks for society. And marriage is a building block for everything that should be done on this planet afterwards. It is a holy institution. And as we pray for the Holy Spirit, I would hope and pray that our marriages would become stronger and better and more loving and more helpful, creating a stronger foundation the other institution that we see in the story of creation is Sabbath. The two institutions that were taken from the garden, Sabbath and marriage. And it says that God rested on the Sabbath day. Now this word rested actually can mean cease to do. Because God, you know, the Bible tells us he, he, he never gets tired or weary. Um, you know, he's not like, whew, I'm tuckered out. Man, that was a long week. Got to take a nap. No. God doesn't get tired, physically tired. Why did he take a Sabbath then? To be with Adam and Eve. It was a holy day, a day for holy convocation. And it was made for man. This was a truth that Jesus had to reinstitute. He had to, reinstitute. He had to take people of his time back to the Garden of Eden, back to the original intention of what Sabbath was given for. Sabbath was given for man. Now sometimes, and those of you who have been in our church for a long time probably remember a time when it probably appeared to many in our church and many outside of our church that people were created to observe the Sabbath. It's hard to understand Sabbath without understanding at the time of Jesus, there were hundreds of laws of how to observe Sabbath. Do this, don't do this. We've had discussions in my family. Well, do you swim on Sabbath or do you just wade? Or do you not get in the water at all? I propose to you this morning, if you go back to the story, we're somewhat missing the boat if we have those type of conversations in the first place. 
Sabbath was made for man. And sometimes, unfortunately, even in our church, and I must tell you as your pastor, that we make jokes, oh, Sabbath lay activities, you know, go off and take a nap, and that's probably not the best way to keep Sabbath. We should be going doing things, for, you know, for good and for God. Hey, if you need a nap on Sabbath, take it. It's made for you. If you're tired and you're worn out from a, a, a tough week, take a nap. Sleep. Rest. Sabbath was made for you. God made it for man. And we can see this in the beginning of the story. That Sabbath was given. And by the way, for Adam and Eve, it, it was the um, you know, first day of the week. Sabbath. They hadn't even worked six days yet. Now, ever after that, they were to work six days and then take a Sabbath. But if you read Spirit of Prophecy, she makes unbelievable statements that there would be no atheist, there would be no criminals if we all took Sabbaths. Why? Because we would all live in the presence of an all-powerful, almighty God who will take care of us even though we don't have to scramble, run around in this capitalistic society and make sure everything is okay and that we're, we're going to be okay. We can just take a break and rest up. Now part of that resting is spending time with God. The Bible encourages us don't get in the habit of missing religious convocations. Why? for encouragement and by the way this really gives us the true purpose of what we are to do on sabbath not get to re get around and criticize and and uh you know make people see what they all should be doing but to encourage one another because it's a break it's a time when we can rest in what god has done for us and he's created this planet for us we can praise him we can just bask in his love a wonderful institution that God gave us. But I'd have to begin to wind down the sermon with saying that one of the reasons why I feel so convicted about preaching out of the book of Genesis is that we live in a world where we see Satan hard at work. Number one, as I've mentioned before in the last sermon, he is trying to get us away from the existence of a God, our society, our men, our educational system. People are trying, he's, he's, he doesn't want us to believe in any type of divine cosmic order. That's his main goal. No, if, if God doesn't exist, if Satan doesn't exist, we're all just rational beings, we're just evolving here. We're just all, oh, well, you know, a couple more billion years and we'll probably have things figured out. Which, by the way, did you see, just this last week, Stephen Hawking, one of the world's foremost scientists and atheists, came out and said, we have a real danger where science is taking us. And he predicts within 100 years the destruction of our whole planet. See, people are looking. They, they understand. If you're smart, you're, you're, you're looking around and you're studying this. You understand where humanity is, is, is headed, really. But Satan wants to blind our eyes to that. And even if people do believe in a God, what, is he, what else is he trying to do? If he can just break down that, that order, and we see it with Sabbath. Well, if, you know, it doesn't matter which day. You know, if God's taking a break on one day, we, I mean, we can take it any day. And what's the real issue here? Is it really Sabbath? No, I mean, if God's taking a break to be with us and we miss a date, I mean, if you're trying to date somebody and you keep setting up a date for Tuesday night at 7 and they keep showing up on Wednesday, it's, it's not even the date night. It's, it's the relationship. It's the understanding that builds a relationship. But let's, let's go even further because it's not just Sabbath. I mean, everywhere we look. I mean, even in crossbreeding, if you read the story of uh, I really hadn't thought about this until I started sitting for the sermon. But even if you look at uh, the order of creation that God created, and he said that each species will, will reproduce according to its kind. Here's a picture of a liger. This is a lion and tiger mix. It is enormous. <laughs> There's a, I didn't put up a picture of it standing on its haunches there, but it's... Uh, I think if it stretches completely out, it's about 10 feet tall. 
It's enormous. No, it's kind of interesting. But what happens when you start to to crossbreed? Uh, what happens with food? We're living in an age where we're starting to modify our food scientifically. Is that good for us? You know, there's a growing body of work that suggests that it probably isn't the best thing. It may do some things for us. But again, we see in the story of creation the, these these lines, this separation, and, and how God is trying to bring it back. Marriage. And it's not just the LGBT question in our society. Anything Satan can do to break down a good, healthy marriage between a man and a woman. This is the original story. This is where the Holy Spirit wants to take us back to, where Revelation 22 wants to recreate us and, and, and make everything new. That is, restore the Garden of Eden, which was lost. We see Satan trying to blur the lines. God is calling for us as a people to proclaim a creator God, a God who can take us back, who can restore, who can bring out of chaos order. During World War II, our bombers wreaked havoc over Europe, and they would drop bombs uh, to help bring an end to the war. And in a small village near an industrial plant, there was a very beautiful, not, not huge, uh, but a very beautiful cathedral. And one of our bombs strayed. We dropped it. It, it hit the cathedral and, and basically didn't completely destroy the whole cathedral, but basically ruined it. Well, after the war, the people of the village approached their priests, and they said, we want to rebuild this cathedral. So he said, well, okay, let me get an architect. He got an architect. An architect came up with some plans, told him how much it was going to cost, uh, along with the contractor. And they began to bring every, everything they had that, that wasn't a necessity to try to rebuild this cathedral. So they had enough money, finally, after one year of raising money. They got enough money to rebuild this cathedral, hired a contractor. The contractor came, and they gave him a, a, a deadline for when they wanted it done. He said, okay. And he came up with an amount of uh, brick masons, stone cutters, uh, artisans, uh, carpenters that he would need to finish this project. The only thing he was having a hard time finding were stained glass artisans. And he, he found two. But he realized to make this deadline, and with the amount of stained glass that had been in the cathedral and that was in the architect's plan, he needed a third one. But he couldn't find one. So they began the project. And one day, a very small man in tattered clothes, uh, just a stubble for a beard, unkempt hair, uh, approached him. Looked like a simple peasant. And this, this man in tattered clothes looked at him and said, I'm a stained glass artisan, and I heard that you need a third one. And the contractor couldn't help but ask him, you? You're a stained glass artisan? Yes, I am a stained glass artisan. He realized that the contractor didn't completely trust him. He said, listen, I'll cut you. Let, let's work out a deal. If you just give me room and board, uh, I'll work, and I'll, I'll, I'll do all the stained glass I can for you. At the end, if you like my work, just pay me the same thing you were going to pay the other two stained glass artisans. The contractor thought that was a fair proposition. He said, okay, you can begin work. And the, the man uh, said, okay, I have one other request. Could you put a curtain around me as I'm working on the stained glass? The contractor said, yeah, I, th we, I suppose we could do that. So he did that. They put a curtain around him. This man came to work every day. He would talk with the other stained glass artisans. They would begin their work. And the whole project went along, and the deadline came. And everybody was done, except that old man with the tattered clothes. But he was nearing finish. And on the day that the whole town people were supposed to come out and look at the cathedral, this guy was just wrapping up his project. And they walked in the cathedral, and the contractor showed them you know, the beautiful marble floors, the, the beautifully cut stones. He showed them the, other, uh, the work of the two other stained glass artisans. And then the curtain was behind the one of the third one. 
and the contractor was completely nervous that it wasn't going to look very good because he himself hadn't seen it. So he said, are you done up there? He said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm done. Okay, you can pull the curtain. Let's pull the curtain. So they got some guys up there. They pulled the curtain away. And the eyes of everybody teared up. It was the most beautiful piece of stained glass work they had seen. And the contractor afterwards, everybody just stood there and looked at it for a long time. So beautiful, so exquisite, the colors and how he had done it. It was, it was better than the work the other two had done. And the contractor approached the man and asked him, you know, how did he do this? How did you make such a beautiful work? And he said, well, every morning I would come to work and I would talk to the other two stained glass artisans and as they would climb up and begin working on their stained glass windows, I would take all the fragments of, of glass that they would throw away in the, in the trash cans and I would pull them out and I wanted, to, I wanted to save those and I wanted to use those and I wanted to come up with a creative way to use that stained glass. Do you feel broken this morning? as you study the story of creation, Genesis 1 and 2, and you look at your life. Maybe your marriage isn't what it's supposed to be. Maybe you haven't been observing a Sabbath. Maybe you're struggling with things that were never there and never meant to be. Maybe you're, you're struggling with the death of a, of a loved one close to you. You're grieving. Maybe you're wrestling with a disease or have loved ones wrestling with a terrible sickness that God never intended. Maybe you're struggling with sin and behavior, habits that God never intended for us to be involved in. Whatever it is you're wrestling with this morning, we all come to this as broken pieces of glass. And as we read this story, we can't help but go to the book of John and say that this God who the Western mind has tried to make into an impotent, non-powerful, and sometimes not even non-existent God. Could he be like this little old man that came in an unassuming way? In fact, John 1 tells us he did. He came to his own and his own received him not. And John tells us in that chapter that Jesus was no imposter. He was none other than the creator of the world. For John 1 says that through him all things were made and without him nothing was made, nothing was made that has been made. That is when we look at the cross. This was not just some Jewish carpenter. This was Yahweh, the one who had kneeled over Adam and breathed into his nostrils. This was the one who had formed Eve, who had, who had created this helpmate for Adam. This was the one who had spoken all of the creation that we see on days one, two, three, four, five, and six. This was the price. And we'll get into that next time. The price of something terrible that was going to occur in God's creation. Where all of everything that was good was going to be marred and broken and tossed in a trash can. And yet we see the price of what it took to bring up out of that trash can the shards and the, the, the ragged, jagged edges to make something new again and make it beautiful and glisten. Can you sing along with the 24 elders of Revelation 5? You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Who purchased this? Who, was, who could have given his blood to bring creation back into harmony? Could it have been an angel? Could it have been a good man? It could only have been the creator. And if you don't understand the creation story, it's pretty difficult to understand the significance of Calvary and the price that it took to redeem you and me.
praise God that we have a creator God who was willing to step down, pay the price, so that you, who were made in the image of God, might be recreated and might have this hope of eternal glory. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. And God, we thank you. It just doesn't even sound significant enough to thank you for what you've done for us. May your Holy Spirit be with us as we leave this place. May you guide us and direct us, and may you make in us a new creation. May you create in us a clean heart, O oh God. And do not take your Holy Spirit from us, but may you pour it out in our lives and in the lives of those around us and around the world. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.